Anastasia. For the personality, it is the contact with the pure flow of force coming from the soul that is important. Rigdon. Of course, this gives more spiritual powers to the current personality. It begins to feel more of the world of the soul, the world of God, and to understand the essential difference between this world and that one. Incidentally, this is also reflected at the physical level, at the level of the body, because when in this state a burst of energy takes place, there is a strong surge of endorphins and other hormones of happiness, and the person's physical and psychological conditions improve substantially. This is especially noticeable during deep meditations, when all of the person's masks and images fall away, and when an exchange of information between the personality and the soul takes place. I call your attention to the fact that this does not happen in every meditation, but only in those that are connected to the work at the level of the deepest feelings and are aimed at awakening the soul. For example, the lotus flower spiritual practice. The person gets filled with the feelings of the world of the soul, of the world of God, Ideally, the meditator gets so deeply immersed into a spiritual practice at the level of feelings, by virtue of turning off all his thought-form perception and completely abstracting his mind from all the thoughts, that he starts to directly perceive the flows of the force emanating from the soul. During such deep meditations, The personality feels that world and the processes which have no analogs in the material world. This is why that world, the world of God, the world of the soul, cannot be described in words. It can only be felt. In such a deep meditative state, one begins to understand and feel what true freedom is. He becomes internally independent from the directives of the animal nature and from the aggressive influence of the surrounding material world. He becomes stronger spiritually and begins to realize that this material world is not his native world, that it is an aggressive and dangerous environment for his soul. But of course, all this happens only when a person does spiritual practices in a responsible way, when he systematically monitors his animal nature, controls his thoughts, does good things in the outside world. That is when he's thoroughly engaged in developing himself internally and in accumulating the baggage of good deeds, thoughts, and feelings. But as a rule, such people are very few. Most of the people who try to do spiritual practices are faced with a certain distortion that occurs at the level of the material brain, or rather consciousness. This is exactly what I spoke of earlier. Apart from the subpersonalities that serve as optical filters through which information flows pass from the soul, there are also, so to speak, associative optical filters of the brain. Essentially, these are our associations that are kept in the memory cupboard, which stores our life experiences, impressions, and so forth. The overwhelming majority of them are related to the three-dimensional world. The thing is that human consciousness from the time of birth of the body is tuned to perceive this world, although it is programmed for different states and modes. By changing the state of consciousness, a person can switch to other programs of perception. So associative distortions occur as the brain processes the information received during a meditation. If a person is not at all prepared for such a perception of information in an altered state of consciousness due to sporadic spiritual work of this personality just from time to time, the brain, while interpreting the received information, will give output at the level of associations which are available in the memory, and of the overriding priorities of the familiar world. In other words, the received information, upon processing, will be distorted by the associations of the material world. A similar thing, but with a lesser degree of distortion, 
happens to those who are trying to meditate systematically but do little self-development as far as tracking the thoughts of the animal nature goes. Anastasia. That's the problem. People who become involved in spiritual practices do not yet quite understand the point here and what creates conditions for soulful joy. They do not yet distinguish between thoughts and feelings in their consciousness, which ones are from the animal nature and which ones are from the spiritual nature. They're better at understanding the joy that they experience on a particular occasion in the material world is more understandable to them because there is acquired experience. However, spiritual practices during which contact of the personality with the spiritual world happens and the understanding of what the real spiritual joy is, just like everything new for the living personality, require first of all active practice by it and also diligence, patience, belief in oneself, and a sense of purpose. In other words, they require obtaining new experience, moreover, in a state of consciousness that is unusual for a person. Rigdon. That is true, which is why it is easier for beginners to perceive the basic information through associative examples, parables, and so on. Perhaps I will once again explain all that I have said about the optical filters by using imagery for better understanding. The soul is like a clear spring, a well. When you feel the soul, when you maintain constant contact with it through feelings, then the most important spiritual deeds in life, good deeds, helping others, happen as if someone is helping from above. Things go well, even when circumstances seem to be not in your favor. And most importantly, you feel and understand this support at the deepest level, as if you know this in advance. But when the animal nature begins to dictate to you its rules of the game, usually quietly and unobtrusively, the connection through feelings with the soul gets lost, or rather it becomes impaired. Figuratively speaking, The more your attention is captured by the game of the animal nature, the larger the surface area of this clear spring that gets covered by a coating. And the deeper you plunge into everyday problems, viewing them through the prism of your animal, the thicker this coating becomes. Accordingly, the latter makes it more difficult for the personality to connect with the soul and naturally with God. You start to have fears suggested by the animal nature. A lot of empty fuss appears, and you become burdened with numerous problems. You cease to understand all the importance of spiritual work on yourself. You begin to unjustly blame or resent the people around you. When you notice these things, know that this is another attack of your animal nature, and it is necessary to take urgent action to restore the lost connection with the soul, to break through this figuratively speaking built-up thickness of coating. And when you get to the clean water, the contrived problems will disappear and you will understand the most important thing again and see your main goal. The personality is just an embryo of an individual consciousness of a possible future spiritual being. In and of itself, it represents nothing spiritually. The soul, however, contains great potential. But without the fusion of the soul with the personality, this potential can be wasted. It is only when, relatively speaking, a resonance of vibrations, a kind of fusion, impregnation of the soul by the personality happens. Only then, a new immortal spiritual being is born, with an individual consciousness and great spiritual potential. In this lies the meaning of human existence, either victory of life or defeat by death. Anastasia Yes, the winner is not the one who has death, but the one who has spiritual life. Rigdon Absolutely. What is spiritual life? Life is a sequence of events where each moment is a link in a chain, 
like a film frame of the footage that captures all the thoughts and deeds of a person. Sometimes you watch a good movie and get positive impressions from it, as most of the frames in it are bright and vibrant. And sometimes you watch another film and it creates a depressing mood because most of its frames are dark and gloomy. So it is important that your live film is full of light and brightness and that it has as many good film frames as possible. And every frame is a moment here and now. The quality of each frame of your live film depends solely on you because you make your life either bright or dark with your thoughts and deeds. Each moment lived by you cannot be erased or cut and there will be no second take. Spiritual life is precisely the saturation of each frame with kindness, love, and good thoughts and deeds. The main thing is to clearly orient your life towards the spiritual nature, to do spiritual practices, to expand your horizons of knowledge, not to yield to provocations of the animal nature, and to create in yourself a feeling of true love for God. And of course, to do good deeds more often and live in good conscience. This is daily work and a gradual victory over oneself. All of this makes up your path, which no one will walk for you, and no one will do the spiritual work for you. Anastasia Yes, once you said words that got etched in my memory. No one will save your soul for you, and no one other than you will do this spiritual work. Please tell the readers how a person should approach spiritual practices if he sincerely desires his spiritual salvation. Rigdon For the person seeking to unite with his soul, it is important to treat each meditation as the biggest and the most important celebration of his life. Also, even while doing a well-practiced meditation, it is necessary to dive into it to the maximum and each time to try to reach a new level of feeling it. Then the person will develop, rather than mark time, and each meditation for him will be interesting and new in the range of feelings and enthralling in perceiving and mastering it. Many people mistakenly believe that it is enough just to learn how to do a certain meditation technique, and that is all. Something good should happen to them, like in a fairy tale. No, this is a mistake. A person will change for the better only when he himself aspires for it, when he makes the spiritual a top priority of his life, when he controls his thoughts each second, tracks manifestations of his animal nature, does as many good deeds as possible, lives with only one main goal, to come to God as a mature spiritual being. Meditation is just a tool with which you must toil for a long time to make something good out of yourself. Besides, this tool is many-sided. For example, man will not be able to fully comprehend, that is to thoroughly know, the lotus flower spiritual practice. An entire life will not be enough. Any meditation, just like wisdom, is limitless in perceiving. Meditating is boring only for those who are lazy or exalt themselves out of pride. I have mastered this meditation. I want another one. I repeat that meditation is a tool, and one who sincerely wants to reach spiritual heights and is not too lazy to work on himself can attain the maximum even during this life. Anastasia This is all true, but I encountered many people who instead of not losing valuable time and hurrying to change themselves, look for an example of a spiritual person in life, in other words, someone who has already changed himself. For them, it is important that somebody is already living like this, according to the spiritual canons and the way of thinking, and not somewhere out there but here in the same conditions as they have. For many, this is significant. Such people believe that if they behold such an example, 
it means that they will be able to live this way too. Rigdon, I have already said that it is typical of people to imitate and have associative thinking, but it is more important to become human yourself and not to waste valuable time looking for someone who aspires to do the same. Human as a personality will be of a much better use to himself and to the society when he becomes an example for others. Working on his internal problems, overcoming the obstacles of his own animal nature, and at the same time living for the people and for the good of people, person paves his own path. All is in the hands of people. One's desire and aspiration does not depend on life's external factors. For some reason, people live in the illusion that someone should come to lead them, do everything for them, and only then will they all be able to live happily. Everyone is waiting for a leader from the outside. But the person, just like society as a whole, should not focus on the external material, but should rather be guided by the inner spiritual. There is a parable in this connection that tells the story of the happiest and the richest man. In one village there lived a man. He stood out among people, because although he lived in poverty, he lived with joy, always selflessly helping others, doing what little he could, sometimes with a word and sometimes with a deed. There were rumors that when he was alone, He praised God, sincerely thanked Him for the rich gifts He had favored Him with. These rumors reached an eminent priest. The priest decided to visit the man, to find out from him for which rich gifts he praised God. The priest came to the shabby shack where this poor man lived and said, Good day to you. The man replied with a smile, I really do not remember a day. That was not good for me. The priest was surprised by this answer because no one had ever answered him this way. So he decided to say the greeting in another way. I just hope that God gives you happiness. The man too was surprised and said, But I've never been unhappy either. The priest thought that the poor man simply was not taught how to conduct a high-style small talk and said, What are you talking about? I'm just wishing for you to be fortunate in life. The man got even more surprised and sincerely replied, I've never had ill fortune, good man. The priest realized that this poor man did not even recognize his eminent person and hurried down to business. All right, well, I wish you everything that you wish for yourself. That I wish for myself. The man laughed. But I do not need anything. I have everything I want. How so? It was the priest's turn to be surprised. But you live in poverty. Even rich people need many things and wish for much, so the poor are in a greater need. The man said, These people are unhappy because they are looking for earthly happiness and live in fear of losing their illusions and being miserable. Unhappy is the one who seeks his fortune in the illusions of this world. After all, there is only one true happiness here, to be firmly united with God and live by His will. I am not looking for temporary well-being because I am thankful for what I have, for what has been given to me in life by God. I gladly accept everything, both what people call misfortune and what people call sorrow. I thank Him for favoring me with rich gifts. The priest scoffed. But God has not given you anything. It means that you thank Him insincerely. The man uttered. God sees me. He sees all my temptations and all my opportunities. He always gives me that which makes me spiritually perfect. The priest asked, How do you live then? The man replied, My concern in each day is only to be firmly united with God and to live according to His will, that my life would be totally united and aligned with the will of God. So goes my day. And in each night, going to bed, I am going to God. Where have you found God? In the place where I found the truth when I had left, like clothing, all the things of the world on the banks of my doubts, and went into his waters of enlightenment, in the purity of my thoughts 
and good conscience. The priest hesitated, for never had he seen such a poor man who would say such words. Tell me, do you speak so out of your own conviction? Are you going to think the same way if God sends your soul to hell? The man shrugged his shoulders and said, Every day I hold on to God, with my whole inseparable embrace of my soul. My sincere love for him is immense. My embrace is so strong and my love for him so boundless that wherever God sent me, he would be there with me. And if he is with me, why should I be afraid? My life is where he is for my soul. It would be sweeter to be out of heaven with God than in heaven without him. Just who are you? The priest asked with surprise and fear. Whoever I may be, I am happy with my life. And truly, I would not exchange it for the lives and wealth of all the earthly rulers. Every man who knows how to be a master of himself, how to rule over his thoughts, and who is in a strong embrace of love to God, is the richest and the happiest man in this world. Say, poor man, who has taught you such wisdom? I have only one teacher, God. Each day of my life, I try to do good in this world. I pray. I practice in having righteous thoughts. But at the same time, I always take care of one thing, to be firmly united with God, with His boundless love for me. Only the union with God makes me spiritually perfect. It is life in the love of God that teaches me everything. Every person is a personality which first of all carries spiritual responsibility for everything that it does and chooses in life. Most people do understand what responsibility is. They take responsibility when they solve everyday ideological, household, financial, and other issues. Basically, they make this effort not for themselves, but for their families, for the future of their children and grandchildren, for their friends, for their loved ones, and so on. So it is in the spiritual as the main task of each person. You must take responsibility for your own spiritual destiny and do everything possible and impossible in your life to unite with your soul and find the real freedom from the material world. There is no need to wait for anyone. You must act yourself. And start, first of all, with yourself. You yourself must be a good example for others, and then positive changes in you and in the society will not keep themselves waiting. Anastasia Yes, there is truth in your words which touches and moves the soul deeply. Spiritual love, which knows neither measure nor boundaries, conquers all. You know, I have noticed that readers of all ages are asking the same question. What is true love? Bearing in mind the information you had imparted about this question earlier, now I understand that in today's society, this notion has been substantially tempered with and distorted in the meaning and essence. Wherever you look, it becomes quite obvious that in today's world, a lack of the real feeling of love is felt by almost everyone. Children, teens, the young, the elderly, single, married people, and people who are not bound by matrimony. Rigdon I shall not say that in today's society the keys to this concept have been completely lost. They do exist, but they're hidden under layers of misunderstanding, under the armor of materialistic worldview. But to find them, people need to know at least what they look like. Another thing is that in a consumer society, everything is done to ensure that people, for the most part, would not find these keys, that they live without this knowledge in suffering, guided only by the animal instincts. Why? Because true love frees man internally and gives the most precious gift from heaven, the real freedom from this material world. This is a very powerful force that awakens the soul. This is the shortest direct path to God. Anastasia, could you recount more about it, at least about things that can be said in public, in open access? 
After all, there are many smart people for whom a hint is sufficient, a tip on the direction in which to search so that they could independently come to an understanding of the essence of this matter so that they could find the keys. Rigdon, I can go into more detail, of course. Unfortunately, people consider love to be anything, from the selfish instinct of the alpha male and the alpha female, to relationships between spouses, parents, and children, and to moral responsibility to their kin, society, country, and so on. But all these are conventions. True love is a very powerful force, much greater than people imagine. It can be said that the current understanding of love is limited in the minds of most people by the stereotypes from childhood. For the masses, this is mostly a game within certain conventions, taking into account local traditions. Regarding these issues, the society has always possessed information that was both accessible and inaccessible to the public. The accessible information focused on government and public interests. It was spread among the masses to propagate certain stereotypes that were favorable to the structures possessing the restricted information. Classified information was used extensively in a variety of structures associated with power, especially of the religious and occult direction. It was based on specific knowledge about the invisible world and made it possible to gain additional power and influence over the masses. An important role in this information is given to one of the most powerful energies in the human body. Conditionally, let us call it the sexual energy. The accessible information regarding this issue, as a rule, is either looped on man's animal nature or is limited in a certain way by taboos with primitive explanations that draw people far away from the essence of the question. As a result, a person either falls into frenzied lust and lechery or suffers from mental self-criticism and excessive restrictions during the bursts of this energy. This happens because a person does not understand his nature and lacks sufficient knowledge about this power. In both cases, he ends up not getting the long-awaited happiness and inner spiritual peace, but feels as a rule emptiness or overexertion. Sexual energy is one of the most powerful forces influencing an individual. You can see its power if you trace the corresponding conscious or subconscious interpretation of desires in person's thoughts. Simply put, if people had thought about the salvation of their soul during the day as much as they think about sex, everyone would have already become saints a long time ago. Power is power, and it all depends on who uses it and how, what one concentrates his attention on. If a person uses it in the context of domination of the animal nature, it turns into a cult of self-significance, lust, aggression, and evidence that you're an alpha male or an alpha female. In the consumer society, everything boils down, like in a children's game, to the unfailing possession of the most beautiful toy that everybody wants. After a person is fed up with this toy, Another chase for another beautiful toy begins until a person sees something even better. There is no end to such desires. Note that the same desire to possess the best and the most attractive is manifested in both men and women in other areas, cars, apartments, clothes, and so on. The root of all this is the animal nature which is always seeking power and acquisition of the temporary, the finite, and the earthly. And in a global sense, the winner is the animal mind, which in such a way, with another set of illusions, makes people spend life energy on and give attention to the mortal instead of focusing on their spiritual salvation. Anastasia
Basically, people feed attention to their enemy, who is in fact killing them.